This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odeschulet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. A Baha'i Perspective is a radio program that examines contemporary issues based on the principles of the Baha'i Faith. If you want information on the Baha'i Faith specifically, you're welcome to visit the website www.baha'i.org. That's B A H A I dot O R G. Or you can call the toll free number 1 800 22 Unite. In May 2006, I went to the home of Greg and Watira Gagira Watson to interview them for a Baha'i perspective. Watira was a bit reticent about doing an interview. So I did an interview with Greg first. Well, by the time I was through with Greg, Watira was willing to share her story. I happened to have Watira's interview ready before Greg's, but Greg's will be coming soon. Watira is a Baha'i from Kenya who followed her sister to the U.S. and ended up getting a bachelor's degree here. I started the interview by asking Watira how to pronounce her name and to describe where she grew up and what was it like growing up there. I did my name. Waidera Kagira Watson. Because because I pronounced it so poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Don't worry. Uh, you have to be a Kenyan, no, for that matter, a Kikuyu, <laughs> to be able to pronounce my name uh, the right way. I can't even pronounce it. My I husband can, can't I even can pronounce it. I can spell even it. Even after <laughs> being married for five years. <laughs> W-A-I-T-H-E-R-A. There we go. Thank you. I come from a very small village that's uh, probably about an hour north of Nairobi called Kanunga. That's where I grew up. And I grew up among many brothers and sisters. How my, many? Uh, 45 brothers and sisters. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. I know. <laughs> I get that all the time when I tell people here in the U.S. that I'm one of actually 46, including me. Mm-hmm. My father had uh, six wives, which is a custom and a uh, tradition in Kenya. Mm-hmm. So my, wa- my mother was one of the six wives. Okay. So how many children did your, did your mother have? My mother had uh, eight children. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So did you live in a village? I, when I was growing up, no, we didn't. We lived in a village. Actually, um, my father's compound was like a villager by itself. Right, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Because at one point, uh, all the wives uh, lived in one compound, mm-hmm. but they all had their own uh, separate uh, houses. But um, I am among the last ones in the family, uh, the last children. But by the time I grew, uh, I was growing up, like some of my mothers had moved, uh, we call, I call all of, all of the six um, my mothers, <laughs> had moved uh, to different parts of the village mm-hmm. or different parts of the region. Mm-hmm. How old were you when the compound finally split up? Oh, I would say probably four or five. Okay. Maybe three or four, because mm-hmm. I don't remember too much of that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And so then what kind of environment did you live in after that? Uh, I think uh, two of my mo- my mother and one of the other mothers are still mm-hmm. lived in this one compound. Okay. And then uh, two of the others were in the same village, mm-hmm. but a few probably kilometers from uh, where we lived and one of my mothers had moved uh, totally to a new different uh, region where my father had bought a farm Mm -hmm. and he needed one of his uh, wives there to take care of the farm. Mm -hmm. So the women did the work? The women and they still do (laughs) most of the work in Africa. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And you went to school? Yes I went to school um, I went to primary school Actually, I didn't go to the, my village. I had to go to a different uh, village to attend school. Mm-hmm. And I walked uh, for a few miles every morning and every evening. And 
life was uh, not as easy as I see it over here. We had to be in school at a certain time, and regardless of where you are coming from, you had to be there at 7 o'clock if you are required to be in school at 7 o'clock. So we had a lot of running to do every morning mm. to make sure we had to be in school uh, at 7 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> and that was through 12th grade? Oh, it's not the same system. We had from primary one to primary seven. Okay. That's what we call the primary school in Kenya. Okay. Now the system has changed. Uh, they have what they call uh, 844. You go to school, primary school for eight years, mm -hmm. then another four years, and then another four years. They call it the 844 system. Okay. But my, uh, the system they had when I was growing up was uh, different. We went to class one up to class seven then after class seven we went to high school mm -hmm. and after i graduated from uh, class uh, seven everybody in the whole country takes a national exam mm -hmm. and the national exam determines what high school you go to so uh after started at uh, seven i got admitted to a government high school which was uh, in the same region, in the central province of Kenya where I grew up. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was quite uh, some distance from my home. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I, that's why I finished uh, my high school for the next four years. Okay. Now, I would assume that your mother or, or the, uh, the other mothers as well did not have any education? No, none of my mothers uh, had any education. Some of them knew how to write their names. I remember my mother telling us a story how uh, her father would not allow her to go to school. Some of her brothers went to school, but uh, she didn't have uh, the opportunity because they were not educating girls at that time. Mm. So she had to run away from home and kind of sneak into the school. So she somehow... Um, got to know how to write uh, her name and a few other things, but without any practice, because uh, she wasn't anywhere, she could use the education or even practice her uh, to write. She mm. kind of almost um, lost it, but when we were going to school, we would come home in the evening and we would practice with her and we would make sure that at least uh, she keeps on with the basics, like how to sign uh, her name, and which was very essential because um, a few of our children became Baha'is, and when they were getting married, it's a Baha'i requirement that both parents have to give a consent, a written consent, and she had no problem signing and giving consent to her children mm -hmm. who became Baha'is when they were getting married. Now, how did they become Baha'is? How did that happen? Uh, one of my older brothers from one of my other moms became a Baha'i first. He had a job in a bank in Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. And at the bank, he was working with this uh, guy who was a Baha'i. And the guy introduced uh, the Baha'i faith uh, to my brother. So my brother became Baha'i first. And then he introduced uh, the Baha'i faith to the whole family. My father was, um, although he had uh, six wives, he still was a very strong person in the church. He was kind of a church uh, elder. And when my brother um, became a Baha'i, my father did not want uh, anything to do with the Baha'i faith near his compound. Uh, he didn't want his other children to be taught or told about the Baha'i faith or who Baha'u'llah was. So at the beginning, it was very hard for me, especially because I was uh, still in high school and uh, still under my father's care. He had to pay my tuition or school fees, like we call it back there. Right. So I had to be very careful. Although I really wanted to learn about, about the Baha'i faith, I could not do that at the beginning because I still needed my father's uh, help paying my tuition. But uh, that's how... Um, Everybody at my home in, or in my family became Baha'i. My brother was the first uh, Baha'i in, in that whole village or that whole uh, region. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, that whole region. And after the Baha'i feed became kind of um, prominent in the area, and other Baha'is, uh, other people joined uh, the Baha'i faith. It's, uh, it was uh, still referred to, my family name is Kagira, 
that stranger region that the Kagira children belong to. So the Baha'i faith was kind of associated with my family in the village and in the neighboring okay. villages. Okay. But you, you seem to indicate that there were some Baha'is in your family, even though your father was forbidding anyone from being near. Yes. Uh, after my f- first brother, John Peter, uh, became Baha'i, he taught uh, two of my sisters that were already grown up and oh, they were away from home. They were away from home, oh, okay. so they okay. had a choice and the freedom to be to become what right. they wanted to become. Right. So two of my sisters had become Baha'is through my brother Peter, okay. and also some of my other um, brothers that were in the village, mm-hmm. but they were independent. They didn't have anything to do with my father. They were adults and they could choose to become what they wanted to become. So they had become Baha'is before I did. Okay. So you went four years to high High school. school. Do you focus on a particular field or subject or is it just general education for those four years in high school, at government high school? Actually what happens in the first two years of high school, you can study any subjects uh, you want to study. Almost everybody uh, for those first years uh, study the same subjects but when you go to form 3 the third year of high school what happened in my high school the teachers the professors uh, selected what they thought uh, that the students were good in so there was some students that they were uh, they thought were very good in sciences and other students were very good in uh, art subjects so I happened to be chosen to be in the science art classes because my professors I thought I would be very good in the sciences. But I didn't want to be in the sciences. My father was a businessman, and most of my brothers and sisters, at that time I think I had about five or seven brothers who were working in a bank, and my other brothers were kind of business people. So I felt that I wasn't going to go to whatever my professors were telling me, uh, the direction my professors were pointing me to. So I kind of uh, rebelled, and I told my professors, no, I can't do the sciences. This is what I want to do. And I had to struggle and hustle with them because um, we don't have the freedom to choose really what you want to study. The teachers chose what they felt that I uh, you are going to be good in, whether you like that to study those uh, subjects or not. So I kind of convinced uh, them, and since my father was kind of uh, well-known and they knew I was this, uh, my father was this person, they allowed me to be in the uh, art classes and the business classes, and mm. that's what I mm. did in high school. Now, it sounds like there was a big change then from your mother's generation to your generation in that it seems like it's accepted for girls to now go to school and be educated. Is, would you, is that a fair statement? Yes, or it's it a fair statement. Actually, when I was growing up, at least uh, almost everybody in the village was going to or had a chance to go to primary school uh, from class one to class seven. But most of the people, even at that time, if I uh, they didn't have the means, they were not able to go to high school. Only the people who had some, Money. I won't say wealth, but some financial means to take their children to high school were able to. And I happen to be very lucky that my father had uh, so much, uh, placed us uh, so much uh, value in, uh, on education, and he didn't have a distinction, any distinction between uh, boys or girls. So um, as long as we wanted to pursue education and to whatever level you are able to, he was there to support you, whether you are a daughter or a son. That's very good. Yeah. Okay, so after high school, what happened? So after you high school, from- actually, I started investigating uh, the Baha'i faith in high school. Okay. Although I didn't come out uh, publicly to state that I was doing it because I knew my father would be against it. It also happened that one of my cousins was a priest in the church and he was influencing my father in making um, decisions and making sure that all his children were not going to be converted to this uh, new religion. 
So um, I started um, inquiring about the Baha'i faith because high school I went to a boarding school, so I was kind of away from home and I could do whatever I wanted when I was uh, in the boarding school. So we used to have these um, ministries, church ministries that used to come to high school every weekend. What did they call it? The church ministries. Okay. And um, whenever they came to school, over the, they used to come uh, to school on Friday night. Okay. And they'll be there for the whole weekend. All right. And by then I had already started uh, studying the Baha'i faith. And every time they came, they would say something. And I would say to them, no, that cannot be true. Because there's this other religion that teaches this, uh, this and that. Like they would say, we should get ready for the coming of uh, Jesus Christ. And I would tell them, no, Jesus Christ is already here. And his name is Baha'u'llah. <laughs> <laughs> so that would create a lot of commotion and the meeting uh, would stop and this person who was uh, preaching would like focus on me and he would ask me questions. I didn't know too much about the Baha'i faith then, but I knew where the Baha'i center in Nairobi was and I had a uh, few pamphlets on the Baha'i faith. So I would tell them, I don't know so much, but I can share what I have, and I will show them the pamphlet. So I'll tell them this is where you can go uh, get information. And they would ask me, are you Baha'i? I would say, nope, <laughs> but I know so much. I mean, I know uh, a few things about the Baha'i faith. So uh, when I came home uh, during the school vacation, I tried to learn as much as I could from my brother uh, so that I can be able to go and argue the questions and start up for myself when the Christian uh, Christian groups came to high school to teach and preach uh, to the high school students. Mm. But um, well, after, I be, after I finished high school, I came back home. And in Kenya at that time, we only had two universities for the whole country. And only the very brightest were able to qualify to go to these uh, two universities, and I didn't happen to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to look for something else to do, and um, my father, I, I, I approached her, my father, and I told him I want to go to this business college in Nairobi, and um, I started taking uh, some accounting classes there. And before I went to Nairobi, um, there were these two Baha'is, they lived in Nairobi, but they used to come to the village like almost every uh, every weekend. I think they were, they were Canadians, but uh, by that time, man, they were not Americans to me. I didn't even distinguish bec between Canada and the U.S. So uh, one time, they came to the village and they wanted to go to a neighboring village to teach about uh, to teach at the Baha'i faith. But none of the people who are Baha'is at my village at that time could really speak English. And these two Baha'is wanted somebody to go with them to the next uh, village so that they can uh, translate an interpreter for them. So um, when they approached me, I told them, no, I can't do it. I'm not a Baha'i yet. And I don't know what my father would say if, they hear, if my father hears that I'm traveling with these Baha'is. Uh, going to another village to teach about the Baha'i faith. But the way they approached me, they said, they told me I was very lucky. Not too many people in the village had the opportunity I had to uh, have this uh, literal education I had. And they told me this is a blessing from God and you need to use it um, in the best way possible. And that they thought uh, that one of the best ways I could use my the literal English I, I knew was by going uh, with them to the next uh, village and helping them. So I agreed and I accompanied them to the next uh, village. And in the process, that's how, that's how I came to know who really Baha'u'llah mm -hmm. was. And I came to know so much more about the Baha'i faith through interpreting for these two Baha'is that were coming to the village almost mm -hmm. every weekend. So what was your father's reaction? Uh, I wasn't Baha'i then, so he didn't uh, react uh, to that, actually. <laughs> just, so go just going with them wasn't as No, it wasn't a, a big deal because I wasn't a Baha'i yet. Mm -hmm. So um, he agreed to send me to college, to a business college in Nairobi. So I had to move from my village, and I 
went to Nairobi to go to school there, and I became Baha'i when I was in Nairobi. That there was nothing to stop me because I wasn't uh, under my father anymore. I was almost independent, although I was getting my school fees from him. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. kind of felt that I had uh, the freedom to do what you I wanted could, you to do. You felt like you could take the risk. Yes. Uh -huh. And I took the risk. I became Baha'i. And I remember one time going back to the village to get my school fees for my business college. And I remember my father being very reluctant to give me the faith because he had already heard from one of my brothers that I had already uh, and I had become a Baha'i. But uh, he reluctantly gave me the money, but he did give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how many years were you at the business college? I was uh, in the business college uh, probably for two years. And during this time, one of my older sisters who had become Baha'i had applied to go to the Baha'i World Center in Israel for uh, service there. And it was really frustrating for me being in this business college because um, we had to take exams. I think after... Uh, Nine, nine months to a year, we had to take an exam that was administered by the Accounting uh, Board of Kenya. And it was really frustrating because they had a certain number of people that they wanted, a certain number of accountants that they wanted to be uh, in the market. So if they want a 100 accountants in the market and 3,000 people set for the exam, um, 2,900 people would fail so I had done the first and the second exam and passed uh, the first time. But when I got to the third level, I failed once. And I had studied so hard for the exam that uh, I got so frustrated. And I decided that I wanted to take some time off because I knew I had done so well. And I could not understand um, why and how I could not have made it. So when this other sister of mine who had gone to Haifa, when I explained that to her that I don't think I thought I think I want to wait for a while before I go back to school, and I just thought I need to take a break, she suggested that I apply for service at the World Center. Um, she said, you can take your break that way. Um, and she sent me application forms. So I filled out my application forms and I sent them uh, to, Haifa, to Haifa at the Baha'i World Center, and I got accepted for a two-year service uh, at the World Center. That was in 1991. Mm -hmm. So I was at the Baha'i World Center between 1991 and 1993. And I got so lucky. I got accepted to serve at the, um, in the finance department at the Baha'i World Center because I had already taken quite a few accounting classes, and my finance experience... Uh, Kind of almost I started there, although I had a part time job here and there in Kenya before I went to the Baha'i World Center. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after spending those two years at the Baha'i World Center? I was at the Baha'i World Center for two and a half uh, years and I went back to Kenya. Mm -hmm. And when I went back to Kenya, I decided that I had to um, travel teach for a while. Because I felt like, I mean, uh, this was a really great uh, bounty for me and a blessing for me to be at the World Center. And I knew there were not so many people in Africa at that time who could even afford to go to pilgrimage. And I had been so lucky to be given this opportunity. So um, when I came back to Africa, I decided to just take some time off and travel and tell people about my experiences at the World Center. I had taken, uh, as everybody else or all the Baha'is who go to the World Center, taken so many uh, Baha'i pictures of the Baha'i holy places. So I had put most of my pictures in quite a few albums. So I take my pictures and go to my on my teaching trips and show them to all the Baha'is that uh, I meet in these places because, as I said, not too many people. Uh, could afford to go on pilgrimage and they really appreciated so much being with somebody who had been at the World Center and seeing the pictures on a picture album because 
they knew most of them had that dream, but they knew there was no way they could ever in their lives probably be able to go to the Baha'i mm. Holy Places at the World Center. Mm. So I went to Tanzania, and I traveled to many villages in Kenya. And then a group of Baha'i women in Nairobi decided to travel to West Africa together. We were about five women. We decided to go to Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. So we... Um, I took a month off and I traveled uh, with these women. And again, I took my photo albums with the pictures of the Baha'i holy places and I showed them to people in every village uh, that I went to. Mm. So how long did you do this travel teaching that you refer to? I you, did it, uh, I think I left... Uh, I left at the Baha'i World Center in November of 1993, and I traveled between November 1993 to um, April 1994. Uh, and in April 1994, my sister, who was at the World Center before me, had come to the U.S. to study. And she happened to be graduating that same year. Uh, I think it was June 1994. And when I came back to Kenya in April, she asked me if I wanted to come for her graduation. And I was like, sure, I don't have a job. I'm not doing anything much uh, in Kenya. So um, she sent me an invitation to her graduation. And I went to the American Embassy in Nairobi, and they gave me a visa. And there I was after my teaching trips, preparing to come back, to come to the United States for my sister's graduation. And I came to her graduation in June 1994, and I've been in the U.S. since then. <laughs> Actually, it's funny how it happened, uh, because when I got my visa, I got a visitor's uh, visa uh, from the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. But when I came to the Logan Airport, they gave me six months to be in the country. I had gotten a five-year visa but when you come to the airport they stamp your passport and they give me six months so here i was in the u.s not doing anything everything being no and so new and strange and very different from where i came from my sister had a job then and she used to leave me in the house mm -hmm. by myself mm. and this is a life i wasn't used to because in africa you are always always are surrounded surrounded by people and here I was from morning to evening in the house by myself, waiting for my sister to come home. Uh, she was the only person I could talk to. Because even when I took my walks outside, sometimes I would say hi to people, oh, good morning. <laughs> and they would just say at me. <laughs> and it was really funny because I was asking myself, how do they say good morning here? Because I'm saying good morning to people. And they're just ignoring you. <laughs> they're just ignoring me or just are staring at me and not oh saying anything <laughs> anything back to me. What part of the country was this? This was in Quincy here in Massachusetts. Uh, okay. So um Warm I got, New England. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got so tired of being in the house by myself, and there was a two-year college, community college, uh, just a few minutes from where my sister used to live. And I walked there one day, and I told them I wanted to take some classes. And they said, oh, sure. Uh, if you want to take our classes, you can go ahead and uh, register for the classes. So I, I registered for a few classes at Quincy College, a two-year community college. And then... Uh, they found out that I had a visitor's uh, visa on my passport, so they suggested I fill out some forms and change my visa from a visitor's uh, visa to a student's uh, visa. So I went through that whole process. I sent my papers and my uh, passport to the Department of Immigration, and they granted me a student's uh, visa, and I started going to college uh, at Quincy College. Mm. I finished uh, my two years at Quincy College. <laughs> <laughs> and by then, my sister had um, already decided to go to graduate school, and she had decided to move to Dallas, uh, Texas, to go to graduate school over there. So she left me here in uh, Boston by myself. <laughs> so why did you s decide to stay behind instead of following your sister? I was uh, still at, at Quincy College. But, I mean, you could always transfer or something like that. I also wanted to be myself 
uh, I didn't want to follow my sister. She was going to go to school over there. And I kind of, um, I liked uh, Boston. After a while, I got used to Boston, and I liked it. But what happened when I graduated from a two-year college, all the colleges in Boston were too expensive for me, and I couldn't afford to go to any uh, of the colleges up here. So um, I had met some people in Boston, some Kenyans in Boston, who told me that they were moving to North Carolina, and they said that uh, colleges were far much uh, cheaper in North Carolina. So I decided to move to North Carolina. Uh, I applied to a four-year college uh, there. I got accepted, so I moved uh, to North Carolina for two years, and I got my other graduate uh, in North Carolina. In what? In accounting. And I liked, actually, North Carolina better <laughs> than Boston. First of all, the weather was so good. It never snowed for the two years I was there, <laughs> which I thought was great. But um, there's life there after living in Nairobi for a while and living in Boston, the life was kind of very slow for me, and I wanted a faster paced life. So you're saying even the Ken life in Kenya was slow for you? I thought Nairobi was uh, no, I thought Nairobi was even faster. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So the city Carolina life, the city life. Right. Yes, yeah. you missed the city life. It was the city <laughs> life that drew me back to Boston? <laughs> okay. So I graduated and decided to come back to Boston. Okay. And I came back to Boston and I first uh, got a few temper jobs here and there, and I finally got a job at Harvard where I have been for the last uh, six years. I've been, I've worked in two departments at Harvard doing financial stuff. I worked at the Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences for five years, and I'm currently working at the Bauer Center for Genomics. I've been working there for about a year in a few months now. Very good. So what does the future hold for you all? Greg mentioned you guys are going to move to Atlanta. We are going to Atlanta, and we think there are great things uh, in store for us. Mm -hmm. seems to be a very dynamic uh, community. And we're going to be in this um, neighborhood where the Baha'is um, have a huge Baha'i center. They call it the Baha'i Unity Center. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, huge place. It's an old church that the Baha'is bought. It's now the, the new Baha'i Center, and they have a lot of activities uh, going, uh, going on there. So, uh, one thing I missed uh, so much uh, when I first moved to this country is an opportunity to tell somebody about the Baha'i faith. And I used to joke, uh, and to joke with my sisters back home and tell them, because in, uh, in Kenya, in, even in Nairobi, uh, people are very, very active, and all the Baha'is of Nairobi, almost every weekend, goes to the surrounding villages, or they all get into a car and go to some village to tell uh, people about the Baha'i faith. So that's one aspect I, about being a Baha'i that I really missed when I first uh, moved to this country. And I used to say that I always look forward to the Baha'i fast, which is um, Baha'i uh, fast for 19 days between the 2nd of March and the 20th of March. And I used to say that that's the only time I can really tell people I'm a Baha'i. Because uh. <laughs> people would <clears throat> come to me offering me food. <laughs> and I say, oh, thank you so much, but I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not eating, I'm fasting. And they say, oh, you're fasting? Say, oh, yeah, I'm Baha'i, and Baha'is are fast uh, during this period. Mm -hmm. So I used to tell my sisters uh, and brothers back home, that's the only time. <laughs> now, now, why is it that you <laughs> find that that's the only time? To that I could tell the Baha'i yeah, because I yeah. felt like people are not very open. Okay. It was very difficult to approach people. Okay. And you couldn't just walk to anybody and start telling them, oh, do you want to hear the message of Baha'u'llah? Baha'u'llah is the manifestation of God for this day. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in, uh, whereas in, in Kenya and in Africa, we just go to the village, go knocking on people's doors, and we tell them, uh, we are Baha'is, we've come from this and that place, we have a new message, Baha'u'llah, the prophet uh, of God for this day, have brought a new message for mankind. And I felt that I couldn't do this here, because first of all, you have to know people. 
you have to know them very well to even start talking uh, to them about religion. And especially in Boston, you just don't go down the street or knock on somebody's door <laughs> and tell them, I'm, ba- I'm a Baha'i and I want to share the message of Baha'u'llah with you. <laughs> <laughs> so did you learn this the hard way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and especially when I first got here and I was saying good morning or hello to people. <laughs> you got the message that maybe you can't say any more than that. <laughs> so I got the message that don't talk to these people unless they talk to you. Uh, okay. <laughs> they talk okay. to you fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like we have um, really a great opportunity in Atlanta because people there, even in North Carolina when I lived out there, you don't have to know people uh, to chat with them or to just say hi and say a few words uh, to people. But uh, up here in Boston, it's really different. I feel like I have to know people to mm. most of the time. It's not all the time, but most of the time. Um, I feel like I have to know people to start a conversation with them. And mm. I think uh, I'm going to have a div- very different experience in Atlanta. Very good. Well, I wish you both the best of luck in Atlanta. Thank you. And, uh, <coughs> Thank you. Okay. And. Uh, Thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you Thanks. for okay. thinking of us. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Watira Gagira Watson, a Baha'i originally from Kenya who now resides in the United States with her husband, Greg. If you want information on the Baha'i faith specifically, you're welcome to visit the website www.baha'i.org. That's B-A-H-A-I dot O-R-G. Or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE.